Welcome to another video from Lockdown Electronics with me Bill and this time we've got some 1980 style electronics trickery I spotted this circuit in something I was reading and uh, I thought it was a simple almost brutal combination of analog and digital so um, what is it? Let's go and have a look. So what is this brutal combination then? Uh, well it's this circuit here uh, it comes from the winter 1981 Electronics Digest, which is a doc, uh, well, it's a, a booklet you can find on the World Radio History website if you want to download it. And it's actually a crystal calibrator. It says for calibrating your uh, uh, shortwave receiver. Now, you bear in mind that in 1981, test equipment uh, was uh, very rudimentary. If you were uh, just a hobbyist, uh, you didn't get lots of clever stuff that you can get now. So this would have been potentially quite a handy bit of kit. So what we've got going on here is we've got a oscillator uh, which is crystal controlled and you can see from the two capacitors it's a Colpitts type of oscillator and the 65p trimmer capacitor connected to the to the base of the transistor uh, would be for you to uh, if you like trim the frequency to be exactly one megahertz. Of course that assumes you've got the ability to measure exactly one megahertz. Maybe if you could find a one megahertz signal elsewhere that was accurate you could perhaps beat it in line with that but um, yeah so there we go. No, it was 1981 for goodness sake we didn't have all this fancy stuff but we've got yet yeah, one megahertz oscillator 65 um, p trimmer capacitor uh, and that produces um, off the emitter there a 1 megahertz uh, out buffered by that small capacitor and then we've also got the um, collector attached to the clock input of a, a 4017 um, just a reminder what connections we've got going on there um, clock input is pin 14 pins um, 8 and 16 of the power supply 13 and 15 are clock enable and reset um, which both need to be held low for it to work properly and then um, the 4017's a, a, um, a counter or divider if you like but pin 12 is the carry out um, so effectively that gives you a divide by 10 so we should theoretically with a 1 megahertz crystal have 100 kilohertz coming out on pin 12 again with a tiny capacitor there to buffer it um, so, so that that's the plan. So we've got a 100% uh, analog uh, oscillator circuit uh, feeding into a most certainly digital CMOS um, uh, counter. So um, that's the circuit. Nice and simple. Uh, nice combination of analog and digital, as I said. Um, so I thought I'm going to build this, but I haven't, not surprisingly, got everything that's on there. So I've substituted a few things. Firstly, I'm using a 2N3904 instead of the BC109. I'm using a 100 picofarad capacitor, and I don't have a 65 picofarad trimmer, so I've just used a 56 picofarad fixed capacitor there. And I don't have a 1 megahertz crystal. In fact, the lowest crystal I've got is 4.433 of which has been pointed out in the past when I've used this crystal that is actually a crystal that um, generates the subcarrier for PAL video systems so that's been retrieved from some bit of kit sometime in the distant past and ended up in my uh, my crystals box um, but hopefully that should uh, at, the, at the very least allow me to to try the circuit out and see what's going on um, so on the breadboard then and bear in mind we're working at radio frequency here on the breadboard so it's not going to be the best um, oscillators on the left there um, crystal can is fairly obvious uh, transistor uh, underneath at the bottom and uh, then the red wire that goes across the middle of the board takes the output um, to the clock input of the 4017 and the output of the 4017 is on the, uh, the blue wire to the right so nice simple layout so let's go and have a look at it operating on the bench and see what uh, happens when you put it near a shortwave radio. Here's the oscillator then, as uh, you've seen in the uh, slides earlier. Here's the crystal transistors here, we've got the various capacitors there. 
and um, across here we've got the uh, 4017 um, and I've just uh, separated it as far as I can just bear in mind we're operating at over 4 megahertz here on a breadboard so it's not going to be the best um, and so what we now need is uh, some kind of receiver that will receive um, 4 megs um, so uh, here is my um, Microbit X receiver currently tuned on uh, 433200 I've got it set to, to CW and I've got um, 100 nanofarad capacitor here uh, attached to the aerial just to give it a little bit of uh, equipment sympathy so there's no way I can directly connect the oscillator output to the um, to the transmitter oscillator is running um, so let's move the end of this capacitor uh, near to the output I think that's probably all we need to do that will probably be su sufficient if it'll if it'll stay there for me yeah and now what I'm going to do is tune the microbetics up and you can hopefully hear this coming in so a very strong signal being displayed there now and if I go past that You see the S meter drops down again. There's a little bit of delay in the way the S meter works on the Microbit X. So we clearly have got a very, very strong signal there. And just to verify it really is the oscillator that's doing that, if we move away, you can hear the change in volume as we move, move away from the circuit. It obviously is leaking all over the board, but uh, you get the general idea anyway. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hop on to uh, VFOB which I've currently got tuned down at 446 kilohertz and I'm going to put the um, wire near to the output of the 4017 which is this blue wire here so we'll just whoops we just took it under that capacitor there if we can yeah now this radio isn't particularly sensitive at this frequency range but since it's got a stonking signal I would imagine it's going to do something. There you go, it's nowhere near as loud as it was on 4 megs but there again this receiver um, really only gets going at about 3.5 megs. So if I tune below that down to about 440 you can see the S meters dropping down and if I come back up Now bear in mind of course that frequency readout isn't necessarily exact because we've got a beat frequency oscillator working here and of course this radio isn't calibrated either. Um, but what you can see there is we've got the marker at um, uh, four, 4 megs and we've also got marker uh, 10 times lower on the output of the 4017. So it's working. Let's now um, use some more modern test equipment to, uh, to have a look at exactly what's going on with that circuit. OK, here we are back with the breadboard again, same circuit. This time we've got uh, two oscilloscope probes attached, one to the output of the 2.2N capacitor, sorry, 2.2P capacitor on the output of the uh, main oscillator, and we've got uh, another probe attached to the output of the uh, the carry output for the 4017. So let's have a look at the scope display. You can see that here. And what you're seeing here is the output of the 4017. A little bit of ringing on those um, edges, which I guess is not um, entirely surprising. And um, of course, we've also got uh, a second probe, which I'll now switch on. I'm triggering off the um, uh, lower frequency output, so we'll now put the um, the channel on and that looks a slightly confused display but um, if you can be bothered to count you'll see that there are in fact 10 uh, blue wave peaks for every um, peak of uh, one of the yellow trace in other words we really are getting divided by 10 and if I adjust the time base a little bit and that makes that even clearer then you can see there yeah that's the output of the two um, uh, two parts of the circuit. So I think it's also worth saying that um, we've clearly got uh, something which approximates to a sine wave coming off the crystal oscillator and we've got something in the form of uh, the output from the 4017 which is a signal which definitely belongs in the 
digital domain very different um, so I think it's perhaps worth uh, you know we're looking at this in um, in the time domain I think it's perhaps worth having a quick look at these two signals in the frequency domain um, to see what uh, what we've got so um, I've got some screen grabs that I took earlier from the spectrum analyzer so I won't um, uh, bore you with filming that um, but you can see here that we yeah, we've got some harmonics extending up there from the um, from the 4.3 meg oscillator uh, they're not too bad but if you now look at the output um, of the 4017 um, you can see it's harmonic city uh, and that's because uh, you've got square edges and of course that waveform would be very uh, rich in harmonics um, so you won't just have one marker you'll have markers all over the bands but I think what you perhaps need to bear in mind here is that um, you know I'm very lucky to have access to uh, uh, modern test equipment particularly the scope and especially the spectrum analyzer but these days of course you know the tiny SA is also uh, more than capable of displaying this kind of thing for uh, a reasonable price uh, back in 19 in the 1980s 81 when this circuit was um, was published <laughs> uh, hobbyists would never even have dreamed that they would have access to such such test equipment so uh, just bear that in mind you know this was being used as I showed you earlier to show up markers on a shortwave receiver which it does rather well okay well there you have an interesting combination of the analog and digital world I think it's sometimes good to remember that um, back in the 80s hobbyists simply didn't have access to lots of sophisticated test gear unless they'd got um, some very good contacts in the trade who allowed them to perhaps borrow or use stuff. Um, I, I certainly had a, an analogue multimeter uh, and that was about it. So yeah, I um, hope that's been useful. That is the kind of thing that you'd build and use back in the 80s to align your short as receiver and clearly does the job very effectively indeed. Thanks very much for watching and look forward to seeing you on the next video.